The concept of risk-based thinking has been implicit, implicit, I should say, mm -hmm. in previous editions of ISO 9001 through uh, things like requirements planning, review, and improvement. But ISO 9001 2015, the new version of the standard, now actually requires company to use risk-based thinking to manage their business. And as basic as this may seem, the idea of looking at all processes with an idea toward, <coughs> quotes, you know, what are the risks, is still a topic that confuses a lot of people in all of the webinars that we do. Um, and we get questions like, uh, do I have to look at risk as it involves my whatever process? You know, so blank, people aren't yeah. sure why, yeah, I need to look at risk here, but I need, do I need to look, look at it over there? Mm -hmm. Big question that comes up all the time. Also, um, which stakeholders do I need to consider when I look at risk? So yeah, obviously, uh, maybe my, uh, my immediate customer, but uh, you know, w what about this guy over here? Do yeah. I have to concern? So there's still a lot of questions about it. Or actually even, <laughs> what? do you mean by risk? Yes. Some people yeah. still aren't even sure what the term yeah. means within the context of an organization. Right. So even though we've been talking about this for quite a while, there's still a lot of questions about it. Well, with us today via Skype to answer a few of those questions about risk is Richard Harpster, president of Harpco Systems, which specializes in providing software training and consulting for risk-based product lifecycle management. Hi, Rich. How you doing? All right. <clears throat> well, hopefully you can shed a little light for us on risk this morning. Um, we have been talking about on this show and in previous webinars about risk-based thinking for a long time, but two, three years or more. Mm -hmm. Do you think that people still don't get the concept? Um, I would say there's, they're struggling with it, and one of the reasons they're struggling with it is there's so many stories out there about what it is. Um, one of the questions I'll answer quickly is your definition of risk. It's actually very simple. Basically, whenever an objectionable incident occurs, you're exposed to harm. So the definition of risk is the probability of that incident occurring in combination with the severity of harm that you're going to see. So when you have a process, anytime you produce, say, an out of spec condition, that would be an objectionable incident. So you have to try to determine what is the probability it's going to happen? What is the harm that people are going to experience? So basically, you can set its risk level. Now, in a company, there's all kinds of sources of risk, and you have very limited resources to go after them. So you use this technique called risk-based thinking to determine where to spend your resources. As simple as, the, as that definition is, I've been to conferences, actually gave seminars on how to implement risk-based thinking. And when I attend different sessions, I'm confused when I walk out. So uh, it's really quite simple uh, to implement. The other good news is, is that I don't know of any companies right now that aren't implementing some form of risk-based thinking. As an example, if uh, somebody comes to you with new business and you sit down and you try to decide whether or not you should take it before you take it, that is a form of risk-based thinking. And finally, what I'd like to say is, is that you should not implement risk-based thinking just because the standard requires it. You should implement it because if you truly implement it correctly, it's going to save you a lot of money. And, and Rich, uh, you know, Dirk alluded to this in, in our intro to you. I mean, you know, we've done a lot of webinars on this topic on, on risk-based thinking. We're doing one with you um, th this week coming up uh, on Wednesday, the 17th. So in, in, inevitably, when we do these webinars, somebody always asks, well, you know, do I have to analyze the risk of, of this or that, depending on, on my, my unique situation? So the question is really, there's maybe confusion as to what processes or departments that someone really has to consider when they, they look at risk-based thinking. Is, is that correct? Well, ISO actually is non-prescriptive in terms of being be very detailed of what it is they want you to do. Uh, there's basically three areas they want you to focus on. One is like opportunities, like I just discussed, and that is an opportunity for new business. You know, they don't want you bringing in business that you're not capable of handling. The other opportunity is your processes. Now, what the standard requires is that you sit down and you define what processes make up your quality management system. 
And whatever those processes are, and again, the standard is non-prescriptive, you can make it whatever you want to be, they expect you then to basically go through those processes and, and apply risk-based thinking, which basically says you go through the process, you say, how can it fail? That failure is an objectionable incident. What is the risk? And then how am I gonna, is that risk acceptable to me? The third area they want you to use it in is a thing called plan, do, check, that. Now without risk-based thinking, you sit down, you have a problem, you develop a plan, you do it, you check to see if it worked, and um, you implement if it does work. Well, any difference with risk-based thinking is you plan, but before you do, you do a risk assessment on it. So you would take the information from, let's say it was a, a manufacturing issue and you use process FEMAs and as your risk tool, you would basically, you do your plan and you basically would look at your process FEMAs to see if they tell you anything about that risk or you could actually do a little mini process FEMA on the process change you're intending to do. So basically, instead of plan, do, check, act, it becomes plan, assess risk, and then only if the risk is okay, do you do, do you check, do you act. And once you've done all this, and you, you, you're, you're going to either get a, a, a surveillance audit or you're going to be audit, you're, you're going to go for ISO 9001 2015 for the first time, an auditor comes in, what kind of proof are they looking for that you're actually doing this thing called risk-based thinking? I mean, what kind of documentation or whatever proves that, oh yeah, I'm doing this? That's pretty interesting. To me, the standard is like a, the Wild West. I mean, the good news about this standard is it's non-prescriptive. The bad news about the standard is it's non-prescriptive. So <laughs> the bottom line is, is the standard even says they do not require you to have a formalized risk management system. It doesn't have to be documented. Now I sit back and I say, you know, how does one implement something that's not formalized, that's not documented? The other good news about it is uh, in the standard, it also says if you want to go further than we recommend, you can go further. So the bottom line is you don't have to show them a risk management procedure and how you do it. However, you do have to show them evidence. And as far as the evidence you, we, you would have to show, I would go back to the definition of risk. The bottom line is you have risk because you have an objectionable incident. So you better have documentation of an incident. And then when you have that risk, you got to have a harm. And so you better have documentation of what you think the harm is. You also have to, have to have documentation of how probable the incident is. And then you have to identify, well, what exactly do you think was the root cause of the incident? And what did you do to make it go away? And then finally, you have to assess the impact either on the severity of harm or the probability of the incident. So you have to have some documentation that this is how we evaluated the check. And then this is how the either we reduced the probability or we reduced the harm or we flat out decided if maybe you're in a design stage that, hey, we shouldn't be in this business, we're not gonna do it. So so I think if you have those basically six elements, objectionable incident, probability of the incident, the harm, your root causes, what you did to make it go away, and the results of your efforts, you've met the requirements of proving you're implementing risk-based thinking. And, and Rich, this, this applies, uh, you, you mentioned um, things that have already happened, but I mean, you you're also would be, you would also have to assess potential risks, right? So maybe you haven't had something oh, yeah. happen, but this could, this is potentially something that could happen down the line? Oh, absolutely. In fact, the main, the main different, the main core principle of risk-based thinking is preventative. It's like a lot of people, one big mistake when they do uh, design femurs or process femurs, they see them as like a, almost like a fault tree, okay? What you wanna do is you wanna try to anticipate all the sources of potential risk and put controls in. On the design side, the risk occurs because you release a design spec that when manufacturing builds it to spec, the product's not gonna work, okay? Like, you know, anybody who's in a manufacturing process, we used to have a term, I was the plant manager at Forum, we called it a mystery defect. Well, it's a problem that occurs, you spend a lot of effort trying to solve it, 
and it mysteriously disappears before you do. Well, a lot of those issues are design issues. They're not even manufacturing. So if we can catch that issue before we release the spec, we stop that problem. And similarly on the process side, when you do a process FEMA, you want to analyze not only the current causes of defects, but we teach basically you want to do a very structured decomposition so you can identify all the sources and hopefully prevent issues before they happen. Like in the plant that I managed after nine months of implementing risk-based thinking on a process, we reduced reject and rework by 40% and we cut our maintenance delays by 40%. So it's, like I said in the beginning, don't do risk-based thinking because the new ISO standard tells you to. Do risk-based thinking because there's a lot of money in it. All right. <clears throat> well, uh, we could talk about this a lot more and, well, fortunately, we'll be able to next week. <laughs> because if you're interested in learning more about this topic, uh, we, uh, Quality Digest mm -hmm. and Harpco Systems, uh, are presenting the webinar 10 Things You Need to Know When Implementing ISO 9001-2015 Compliant risk-based thinking. That's going to be on Wednesday, January 17th, next Wednesday at 2 p.m. Eastern and 11 a.m. Pacific. Uh, Rich Harpster here uh, will be your presenter and I'll be your host. So keep an eye on in your email inbox inbox for an invitation to the register. Also, there's a link underneath the player page down there that you can click that'll take you out to the registration page and you can sign up for that. Rich, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. I look <laughs> forward to the webinar. Hey, well, yeah, that's right. We'll see you next week. We'll see week. you on Wednesday. Thanks, right. Rich. Take it easy. Bye. Okay. Yeah, have a good weekend.